Blog Talk Radio. Network. A radio show reaching beyond the limitations of our minds and beliefs into a world of inspiration and empowerment where the impossible is possible. To talk directly to the host or guest, call 347 637 2650 and press 1. 347 637 2650 and press 1. To learn more about your host, Betsy, and her new riveting book, Angels, Aliens, and Prophecy, as well as breaking Earth news worldwide, go to BetsyLewis.com, B-E-T-S-E-Y-L-E-W-I-S.com. And now your host, author, intuitive, earth keeper, and earth mysteries investigator, Betsy Lewis. Hello and welcome to the show this evening on October 10th, 2012. We've got quite the show for you tonight and just in time for Halloween. David Weatherly is my guest tonight. And I met David this past May at a UFO conference where we were both speakers and I was blown away by his supernatural stories of the black-eyed children and I know you will too. So for over 35 years, David has explored the world of the strange, investigating cases around the country and abroad. He has written and lectured on a diverse range of topics, including cryptozoology, ufology, and hauntings. David has also studied shamanic and magical traditions with elders from numerous cultures, including Europe, Tibet, America, and Africa. He has appeared on numerous radio shows, including Darkness Radio, Project White, Paper, Haunted South, and Paranormal Life. He is a writer for Intrepid Magazine. Uh, Be sure to visit David's website, twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com and leprechaunpress.com. Welcome to the show, David. Good evening, Bessie. Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, it's great to have you on the show. Your book is just astonishing, and it reads like a Stephen King horror novel, except the stories are true. (laughs) They're based on true events. You know, you really should have a warning on the book that says, don't read this alone or late at night, you know? (laughs) I think the cover serves as a warning. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, well, let's start out with, how you? How in the world did you get involved with this incredible story? And how did the people contact you? Tell us about that. With this particular topic, what happened was that uh, having an interest in all things paranormal, you know, in the late 90s, I heard some of these stories about black-eyed children that circulated in the um, early days of Internet chat rooms and forums. And I thought it was interesting at the time. You know, I read the accounts and uh, sort of took note of it and filed it away. But at the time, I I looked at it and thought, well, this is this is compelling, but at the same time, it could be an urban legend. It's sort of right on that border. And you know, I set it aside, like I said. But a few years later, I ran into a gentleman who I knew for some time, and. He was, uh, I, yeah, I call him a John Wayne character. He was six three, six four, somewhere in that range, uh, a bodybuilder and a martial artist and a prison guard. Uh, mm. And this guy had no, absolutely zero belief in anything paranormal. In fact, he thought it was all a joke. Constantly made cracks about it because he he knew that, you know, it's, it's what I did. And uh, you come to learn over the years being in this field that, Often people like that who can't leave it alone, it's because they have something personal that they can't get beyond. And that's what turned out to be the case with this gentleman. He caught me one day having lunch. Uh, His name is Paul. His story is detailed in the book. And, you know, he asked Mm -hmm. if he could join me. And suddenly this guy just opens up with a story. And he he pulled out this account. 
he pulled out this account, and it was just uh, it was mind-boggling at the time, you know, because here was a first-hand account of someone who had encountered these children and had this terrible experience from it, and you know, couldn't couldn't move beyond it, couldn't figure out what exactly he had encountered. And, you know, he was looking for answers. So I did my best to help him at the time. You know, basically told him, look, you're not alone. There are some other accounts out there. And uh, I started to investi- investigate and explore it further. And, uh, you know, over over the course of the year, started getting accounts and tracking down witnesses and interviewing people directly who had had experience with these children. Now, is this happening just in the United States, or is it a worldwide phenomenon? Oh, it's worldwide. Yeah, really? There, there are uh, some international accounts in the book. You know, there's a really amazing one from London. There's some in Canada. But I, I've got accounts in my files from, you know, places as diverse as uh, Australia, South Africa, uh, you know, just all over the world. Now, how long ago did this start? Do you have accounts of it going back to the 1800s or maybe even earlier? Is this something more recent, more modern? You know, that's interesting because what happened, when I when I started delving into this, one of the things that I sort of set out to examine was whether this was a modern phenomena that mm-hmm. could be um, partially attributed to you know, modern media. In other words, there's a lot of depictions in movies and television of, of black-eyed beings, especially over the last couple of years. Now, Paul's account, you know, as I said, I got that one in the early 2000s, and the Internet accounts had shown up in the late 90s. So what I did was I set to uh, set myself to find accounts prior to that and found some pretty amazing things. I found a really fascinating one from 1950. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, it predated these uh, modern images. And what I found over the course of writing the book was that what's modern is the term uh, black-eyed children, or uh, they're also called black-eyed kids, or BEKs for short. So this modern sort of slang term that has been applied to them is really what is uh, sort of the new aspect of this. And what I found in old stories was that there were accounts of these beings, uh, sometimes mm-hmm. children with solid black eyes, but they were never referred to as, as a black-eyed child. You had to look at it within the time period and the cultural context of the people who had the experience. Uh, so what I mean by that is the one from 1950, you know, it, it was a black-eyed child, but the account that the family you know, talked about through the years was that Harold, the young man who met this black-eyed child, you know, the family always said Harold met the devil uh, because this was a rural farming community, and, you know, their way to understand what had happened was, well, my gosh, he, he he's met the devil. He's met something evil. And, uh, you know, that's what they applied to that being. Sure, sure. Now, I know you say black-eyed children, but for people that have never read your book or heard your talk or anything, tell us what makes their eyes so different. Tell us a little bit about, describe them, because I know that's, that's what is so unusual about these children and very spooky, too. <laughs> sure. Well, let me describe a, a um, sort of a generic encounter. Right? I can give you Paul's encounter uh, because that mm-hmm. contains a lot of the classic elements. Okay. Uh, you sure. know, Paul... Paul came home from work. He was uh, home alone because his wife and child were out of town. He went into his kitchen, uh, was making himself a sandwich or something, and he heard this long kind of continuous knocking sound. And, you know, like most of us would do, it gave him pause. He stood there for a minute, and he's thinking, is somebody knocking on the door? Why didn't they use the doorbell? He's going through all the standard things. and But this knocking just keeps going. So... Paul goes to the door, he opens his front door, and standing on the steps are these uh, two boys, he estimated around 10 years of age. They are standing on the steps with their heads tilted downward, and when he opens the door, one of them says in, in a very monotone voice, hey, we thought we'd come in for a bit. 
And, you know, Paul being an OBS guy, you know, he kind of puts his eyebrows up and he's like, uh, <laughs> I think you guys have the wrong house. And the immediate response is, well, we'll just come in anyway. So what's happening to Paul as this encounter is unfolding is that when he opens the door and sees these two boys, you know, he told me that initially he just felt a little uneasy, which didn't make sense to him because they're two 10-year-old kids. You know, Paul's kind of a, you know, tough prison guard guy. I mean, he's not, never used to being in the type of situation where he's afraid. So as he tries to dialogue with these two boys, his unease rapidly goes to nervousness and he's trying to interact with them but they basically keep redirecting and repeating the same phrases in this monotone voice that you know he should just invite them in now he knows everyone in the neighborhood he lives in a suburban area uh you know he's <clears throat> he's running through all the logical things in his mind thinking well these aren't uh friends of my child because they're too old these you know these aren't kids I've ever seen in this neighborhood he steps forward in order to get a better look at these kids as is his nature and when he does they they raise their heads and they make eye contact with him and it's then that he realizes that their eyes are solid black we're not talking about just the pupil the entire sclera is solid black so you know it, it often uh, people equate it as Similar to the depictions of the gray aliens, you know, just this solid black eye mm -hmm. with no evidence of a pupil or anything else. So no whites, no other colors showing. Their skin is very pale, uh, pasty looking is what a lot of people describe it as. And, you know, when Paul sees this, it, it sort of makes him recoil and, you know, this uh, monotone dialogue is continuing. He slams the door. At this point, he, he's he's really afraid. He, he's almost terrified. Uh, he he puts his back against the door for a moment. Then he walks across the room into his living room. He has a very open floor plan in his house. He's standing there shaking and, and sort of rubbing his head, and he hears this rapping noise again. When he turns around, uh, he sees the face of one of these kids peering in the glass pane on the side of his front door. <laughs> And, you know, whether he was far enough away or whether, you know, it was just too much, it's hard to say. But at that moment, something kind of clicked in Paul, and he went immediately from fear to anger. He rushed into his bedroom. He retrieved his firearm. He came running back out, and this is a matter of seconds. Uh, he flung the front door open. And he, he told me the only thing he could think of was he wanted to terrify those kids the way they had frightened him. He flung that front door open, and there's nothing there. Wow. He ran out into his yard. He, he searched his, his yard, his driveway, the street. Nothing. No sign of these kids anywhere. So this is sort of a, a typical story. It contains a lot of the common elements that we see in these mm -hmm. encounters. Uh, the solid black eyes, as I described them, the skin, which is you know, variously described as being pale or pasty. Some people say it looks artificial, which is kind of weird. Um, you know, their, their speech is very monotone. A lot of people believe that they're trying to, the kids are trying to exert some type of mind control or hypnosis during these encounters. And, you know, it's typical from what I have found that the victim goes through three basic stages, uh, usually very quickly, and that's, you know, a, an uneasiness at the initial um, encounter with these kids that goes to nervousness and then it turns to absolute fear and you know people just need to run away from these uh, beings it's like they're picking up something really intuitive about them that they're just there's something terribly terribly wrong about these children and you know uh, another thing about when you said no sclera um, doesn't that allow light to come into the eye so with these that's children, correct. they should be blind, right? <laughs> Absolutely correct, Betsy. You know, that's uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I consulted with uh, physicians when I started looking at some of the, you know, possible explanations for these things. And, uh, you know, doctors have told me even 
even if for some reason that was that had happened, if a, a bean had a solid black eye, you know, they would essentially be blind because there would be no light coming in uh, to allow uh, vision. Well, that's just too freaky. <laughs> it really is. Just close my mind, David. <laughs> but you know what? It's kind of interesting. You said a lot of times they are dressed a little oddly. Sometimes they wear hoodies but sometimes they seem to be dressed in, like, shabby clothes, right? Talk about that. That's correct. There's some variation in the encounters. You know, what we hear a lot of times is if, if the clothing is modern, uh, it's always described as being very drab, uh, usually, um, you know, very neutral colors, grays, blacks, uh, you know, browns. You know, you never hear, for instance, of one of these kids wearing a, a, a black, you know, I mean, a, a red shirt or, you know, a bright orange or anything like that. It's all, it's always these very monotone colors. And mm. what we hear equally as often is that the clothing, uh, you know, I've heard descriptions such as uh, that it looks handmade, uh, that it's uh, often we hear that it's ill-fitting as if it is, uh, you know, as if they're hand-me-down clothing, or um, as if it's uh, old-fashioned attire or something we hear. I've had more than one person say they were dressed like they would, they would uh, imagine Amish kids to be dressed. So, you know, we hear all these things that uh, it's just kind of odd how it fits into the puzzle. You know, it's almost as if mm -hmm. sometimes the clothing was sort of an afterthought, and it was just... Um, you know, this being adopted, it's just because they thought that was, you know, a way to blend in. And that's, that's just really strange, just so strange. Now, another interesting thing is that they always seem to knock on a door in most cases that you talked about in your book. Why don't they dr ring a doorbell? <laughs> don't they know about you doorbells? Know, Isn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> it, it is very funny, and you know, Betsy, it's one of those things that uh, there are just some of these odd pieces to the puzzle, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the, the doorbells, I've never heard of an account of one of these creatures ringing a doorbell. It's it's always a knock, uh, you know, a tapping on the window. I mean, they'll approach people, you know, in parking lots, people sitting in their cars, mm -hmm. and, you know, they'll tap on the window. But it's funny, apartment buildings... Uh, Houses, you know, any number of places, they just won't use the dag on doorbell. It's, it's always a knock. <laughs> that is weird. You know, it kinda, yeah. it, it's very weird. It harkens back a little bit, uh, quite uh, honestly, to something like the men in black. You know, one of the things mm -hmm. that I found really compelling about these stories was that um, these black eyed children. They cross the line into a lot of different kinds of paranormal, uh, paranormal phenomenon, and you know there's a lot of different things. You could argue that they're alien hybrids. You could argue that they're demons. You could argue that they're you know, any number of things because they share just certain things in common with a lot of those. Yeah. And the Men in Black is is a really odd. Uh, you know, sort of manifestation that they share qualities with, and one of them being that, mm -hmm. you know, men in black stories, we often hear that the men in black are confused by, uh, you know, everyday things. You know, like there's a story of of a man in black being handed a fork and just being completely confused as to what it was or what to do with it. So, you wow. know, a doorbell is like that. In my mind, you know, doorbells mm -hmm. are a common thing for all of us now, but, you know, these kids, it's like they don't even know what that is. Now, when they, when someone opens the door, and it's usually people that are alone, right? Yes, almost always. Yeah, and so they seem to know that. They seem to be intuitive. I, I know you talked about, um, I think it was somebody in a, a night guard or something that had a really spooky experience with them. Do you know which story I'm talking about? I, I do. That one was... Um... I believe that was in uh, Toronto. Yeah. Um, yeah. That one's in the book, and uh, yeah, that was that was a really weird one. You know, he was in a he was a night guard for an office building, and you know they came and they were tapping on the glass. These kids, and 
yeah, it's just you hear these odd things sometimes as though they're aware of what you're doing even though they haven't seen you. Right. You know, with him, when he approached the, the glass, you know, he he wouldn't open the door and let him in or anything, you know, but he was, uh, you know, he was basically trying to tell them to get lost and, and they were saying strange things like, you know, we want to we want to read magazines, I think is the, the term they used. And it's funny because he was sitting behind a desk, you know, one of those high um, security desks, and no one could have seen from the street what he was doing. But, you know, he was, he did carry magazines to work, and he would sit there and read them when he was not walking his rounds. And, you know, it was really bizarre to him that they somehow knew what he was doing back behind that desk. And, it, it, you know, that really creeped him out. And, uh, you know, another thing that happened during that particular encounter was that there was this incredibly foul odor that... Um, mm that actually lingered in the area for quite some time that came from these kids, you know, showed up when these kids did. And we hear that in a uh, percentage of these cases. Uh, maybe, oh, I, I don't know, probably between, uh, probably around 10% of the cases or something, um, mm -hmm. I've heard this come up where the people encountering these kids say that there's an odor unlike anything they've encountered before, that it it smells like something decaying or rotting, and, and it's just a, an incredibly foul odor. I, I've had people tell me that they had to, um, you know, throw their clothing out that they were wearing at the time because oh, oh my the goodness. odor still lingered as mm. if it attached to the clothing they were wearing. So, you know, that's that's another bizarre thing that shows up in some of these cases. And, um, you know, there again, that's something that kind of crosses the line because, Really, if we go back to classical uh, undead or vampire lore, one mm -hmm. of the things just associated with them, yeah, one of the things associated with vampires, you know, originally was this foul odor because, let's face it, they just crawled out of the grave. You know, mm -hmm. people tend to forget that now because, you know, everything's these glittery teenage vampires running around, you know, romancing each other. But that's that's really not what classical right. vampire lore is like. Right. I, you know, I was thinking about the zombies, too, the stories of zombies, That's the correct. walking dead out there. And so it makes you wonder if, if they are these soulless beings. Um, I, I know you've brought up many different um, theories about what they could be, um, hybrid aliens. Um, I, I think you've talked about maybe shape-shifting type entities or... Um, you know, maybe do you think even the military could be experimenting with something like this? That I know I've heard of super soldiers. You know, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's entirely possible. I, I mean, it could be some kind of yeah, they could be the result of some kind of genetic manipulation or something uh, going mm -hmm. on. Uh, again, some of that sort of connects back into the men in black uh, parallels, you know, right. because we hear some of the men in black accounts, we hear that the uh, that the MIBs are, are very robotic, you know, as if mm -hmm. they're not natural beings. And, you know, these kids, when they show up, some of the things that um, they come in out of the accounts, you know, they don't really respond to questions, for instance. Uh, they usually, in most of the accounts, seem to have a set number of phrases, almost as if they've memorized them or been programmed to remember certain mm -hmm. phrases, and they just repeat those over and over again. You know, you try to ask them a direct question, and they sort of just redirect with something they've already said. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's very, um, it's just another part of the puzzle. Huh, oh, that's really interesting. And they seem to want to come in to a home, right? I mean, that's really important to them. You know, let me in, take us in. Right. That appears to be the entire goal uh, on the surface of the encounter. They, you know, there are no accounts of them intruding into a person's space. Uh, they, don't, um, they don't go rushing in. You know, they don't jump into people's cars. They constantly repeat and insist that you invite them in. 
and you know they they always have some reason or excuse you know but they they come up with these really bizarre phrases you know things like uh, just you know just let us in this won't take long um, isn't that interesting now you know i was wondering um with any of the witnesses had any of them seen ufos because I know with the men in black, uh, you know, these men in black show up after people have witnessed a UFO sighting. And I wonder if that might be true with the people that you've encountered and, and talked to. Very, very few. Uh, now, there are a percentage of people who have encountered these uh, black eyed kids and believe that the children are alien human hybrids. And uh, some of those witnesses are actually uh, women who have been, you know, have have recall of abduction experiences and believe that they've been used for some type of alien breeding program. So when we get into that realm, we do find some people who have had experiences with UFOs who have later encountered a black-eyed child. But really overall, for the most part, the people that encounter these kids, they have not had uh, any encounters with UFOs or even, you know, I find very often that, that the greater percentage of them really don't have any paranormal experiences uh, prior. Really? You know, they don't, they, they tend to be people without an interest in the paranormal. Uh, they tend more towards, uh, there's a lot of these people, you know, there's very few patterns because when I investigate things, I always look for, you know, the correlations and the patterns. And, you know, sure. naturally when I started exploring this, I, I looked for things like, um, okay, you know, is there is there any commonality in the mm -hmm. victims in terms of age range or geographic region or uh, religious belief? You know, I have a whole broad spectrum of things I go through. And there are very, very few common factors among the victims Interestingly enough, one of the few common threads is that a large percentage of these people are people that are in positions of authority. Hmm. So wow. uh, there are a lot of uh, a lot of law enforcement, military, uh, doctors, uh, government employees, and you know I, I find that very interesting. I mean that's. Um, there's something to that that's still not completely clear, but as I said, it's one of the few commonalities amongst these people. That's interesting. So it seems like what you said from most of these stories that after the children leave or vanish in front of them or just simply vanish into thin air that um, they seem to be harbingers of doom and disaster like Mothman. I mean, it's like they either bring the misfortune or maybe they're just warning people of things. What do you think? Well, there's there's a there's a fairly large percentage of the accounts um you know where the victim does experience uh, negative things in their life after the mm -hmm. encounter and mm -hmm. it can be everything from uh you know family members suddenly dying uh, to, you know, just uh, personal misfortune in terms of, you know, relationships uh, suddenly ending or losing their job or, you know, uh, illness, uh, things like that. So to some degree it seems, now whether these kids actually bring that negative energy into people's lives or whether they're just harbingers of it, it's difficult to say. But, uh, you know, either way it's clear that the purpose that these kids have, you know, there's something, I think there's something sinister behind it, personally. Um, do you? You know, I have people... I was going to ask I, you... I, I do. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. going to ask you what your first reaction was to these stories. Was it disbelief, or, or how did you feel about it? Well, initially, when I heard them, you know, even when I sat down and talked with Paul, I mean, I've, you know, as you said in my intro, I mean, I've done this for over 35 years, so I've interviewed you know, a lot of people, you know, probably in the thousands at this point. And, uh, you know, I think I'm a fairly good judge of character in terms of knowing, you know, when people are being genuine about their experiences. And uh, I didn't have any doubt that Paul was 
genuine in what he was relating to me, and at the same time, it was it was pretty mind-boggling to listen to and you know really take in. So I, I had to sort of set my personal feelings about him aside when I started investigating these cases. And uh, you know, at this point, I, I've met and interviewed so many people that have had personal encounters with them that you know there's there's certainly something going on out there that is unexplained in terms yeah. of these kids. And, uh, you know, after after going over so many cases, I simply don't believe that there's anything positive to these experiences. And I, I've had people try to convince me otherwise, you know. And, and still, you know, <laughs> we'll occasionally have people argue that, well, you know, maybe they're just misunderstood or maybe, you know, maybe there is something positive to these kids. And I, I don't buy it. I just don't. There's too many cases where the results are, are very negative. So, well, I can think of one positive thing, David. <laughs> and I know you mentioned it. You said a lot of the people became more religious afterwards, didn't they? Right. In terms of personal experience, mm-hmm. you know, the the after effects for a lot of these people, you know, is, is first of all, most of them end up behaving like trauma victims. And, you know, they have a hard time moving mm-hmm. past the experience with these kids. And as a result, they do often end up you know, walking wow. the spiritual path afterwards. Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, if anything positive can come from a negative experience, then that's, you know, that's an example of something that can. Uh, sure. Sure. But that, now, that's kind you... of a rarity. <laughs> yeah, right. Have you had any experiences? Have you had any paranormal things happen to you since investigating these cases? Uh, well, I have not personally encountered the Black Eyed Children. Uh, mm-hmm. But there have been some strange things. You know, some really weird things started happening actually after the book came out. And what happened was, this is pretty compelling, the uh, the book had been out a couple of months, and I received an email from a woman who, you know, she started off with the line, you know, I, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. Well, <laughs> that's always a lady comment when I get emails right. from this. <laughs> I never right. know whether to think this is interesting or to think, oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> but uh, this woman was very rational, and I've actually had a lot of conversations with her since then. She uh, she wrote me an email, and she said, you know, um, I just want to know if this has happened to anyone else. I sat down and started reading your book, and uh, the first night my smoke alarm went off. And you know, I got up and I shut it off. There wasn't any smoke. The next time I sat down to start reading you know, about the Black Eyed Children, uh, the timer on my oven went off, and I didn't even know what it was because Uh-oh. I never used the timer on the oven. And so the third thing that happened was that she was sitting reading the book, and her garage door opened itself. And uh, so at that point, she contacted me, and she, she said, "Look, I'm really interested in this, but I don't want any visits." <laughs> You know, just tell me if there's something weird oh, going on. So, oh. you know, I, I, I contacted her back and I talked to her and I, I thought, well, this is, this is kind of interesting, but at that time it was just sort of a one-off thing. Well, mm-hmm. I received a couple of other things that sort of indicated, you know, there was uh, some kind of weird electronic stuff going on around people. And again, we're, you know, we're back in Men in Black territory. Uh, they're notorious for causing electronic interference and sounds on people's phones, you know, when there are men in black encounters. So I thought, well, this is this is really curious. Let's see if anything else happens from it. Um, so, you know, a, a number of the radio shows and podcasts that I've been on have experienced strange electronic interference oh, when wow. we started talking about the black-eyed kids. Uh, I was on uh, Dreamland with Whitley Strieber in uh, right. May. And, you know, we had to, to stop and start recording a couple of times. And Whitley was telling me, Ooh. you know, that he said, David, I, I've done this show for so many years and I've never seen this. He had all this weird stuff going on in his studio and he just couldn't figure out what was going on. Now, interesting enough, Whitley had actually seen a black eyed child. And, uh, you know, he, he revealed his encounter, I think, for the first time during that interview oh, wow. with me and uh, told his story. So. He was especially compelled about the phenomenon. But it got even crazier because it, actually one of my uh, favorite stories from all of this occurring was I had sent the 
a friend of mine had the book in uh, Kentucky, and one day, you know, my cell phone rings, it's, it's him, and I answer it, and there's just background noise. I'm thinking, okay, that's weird, you know, I must have pocket dialed or something. I put it aside and didn't think anything else. So this starts happening, like, day after day. You know, I'm getting these messages on my phone when, when I'm not around, the phone's ringing, and they're all from his number. They're all background noise, you know. I, I listen to a couple of them, and I'm hearing his, his, his child yelling, and I was like, okay. So I sent him a text, and I'm like, hey, man, uh, you know, I think your kid's grabbing your phone and dialing my number because you've called me, you know, all these days in a row. He apologized, like, okay, you know. A couple more days go by, it happens again, <laughs> and it happens again. And then all of a sudden he gets wow. in touch with me, you know, because the phone rings, he gets in touch with me, and he says, oh, my God. I was sitting on my bed reading. The phone was on the bed beside me, and it just lit up and dialed your number. He says, I don't know why it did this. So uh, he took the phone to his uh, cell phone provider and said, why is this doing this? It's only this one person's number keeps dialing. You know, tell me what's going on. Cell phone people couldn't tell him anything. They're like, we don't know why he's doing it. Here's the kicker, and you're going to love this, Betsy. It happened one last time. His phone lit up and self-dialed me the day that he drove into Point Pleasant, West Virginia. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's crazy. Oh, my and goodness. Which, you know, for anybody listening who doesn't understand the correlation, that is the site of the Mothman encounters yeah, and the collapse that's of the right. Silver Bridge. Wow, wow. Well, it, it's like they were listening or watching or something. They were involved. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, David, I don't know. <laughs> it, it sounds like they're uh, they're watching you, so be careful. <laughs> well, it could be. You know, the, the woman I referenced who sent me the original email about strange electronic things in her house, as her story has unfolded over this year, um, you know, she started having – some recall and actually uh, has had some uh, hypnosis done and actually had an mm-hmm. experience with the black guy children that she only remembers pieces of. Oh, so, really? you know, there's this uh, mm-hmm. very odd um, connection there to where, you know, somehow they were interacting with her or this, you know, phenomenon was, uh, you know, causing these things in her life. It's, it's very odd. You know, since we were talking about the children wanting to come into a home. Has anyone ever let them in, and what happened? You know, there's a a very small number of stories that we have, and uh, there's one that's detailed in uh, the book. Uh, It's it's a fairly disturbing story. It was a a woman who was driving home from work in her SUV. She had her 10-year-old son sitting directly behind her, and she stopped at a convenience store. She's done this, you know, a million times. She knows the people, you know, she she leaves her son in the car. She runs in, she grabs her milk and her bread, and she comes back out on autopilot like many of us would be. She jumps in the SUV. She's putting the key in and turning the engine as she's looking up in the rearview mirror. And when she looks up in that rearview mirror, staring back at her is this child with solid black eyes. Oh, oh. He's in the middle of the back seat. He's in the middle of the back seat, sitting directly beside her son. She has an immediate fear reaction. She jumps out of the car. She jerks open the back door, yanks her son out, and runs back in the convenience store. And uh, you know, as the story unfolds, she's the the clerk, of course, you know, comes running around, and he's thinking, you know, what's going on, and she's just kind of stammering about somebody in her car. And, uh, he goes outside and finds the SUV just sitting there with the you know the doors open and he gets her keys and closes the door and there's nobody around and he you know looks around the parking lot and he wants to call the police she insists not to and at the same time she's too shaken to even drive her own car back so she calls her husband who's fairly close by who comes over she hasn't told him yet what's happened she just gets him to come over there they trade vehicles. She gets in his vehicle and drives home. He takes her SUV, 
heads for home a couple of miles away, has an accident and totals it. Wow. He ends up in the hospital. Uh, he's kept in the hospital for observation because they think he has a concussion. And Fortunately, he was fine. As all of this was unfolding, she's trying to talk to her son, and she's saying, uh, who, who was that boy? Do you know him from school? And the response is, well, no, Mommy. She says, well, you know, why Why did he get in our car? And the son says, well, I asked him to get in, Mommy, and I thought we could go to my house and play. <laughs> Just like a so, child would. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, this child really didn't see anything wrong. Uh, you know, he, he didn't. She further questioned him. He didn't really notice anything wrong with the child's eyes, you know, but... Who can say whether he just blocked that out or just did, I mean, you know, as a child, as a 10-year-old kid, so, you know, these things don't bother a lot of kids. Sure. And the result uh, of this encounter and this close proximity that this 10-year-old had to this black-eyed child was that this 10-year-old boy became very ill. And they ended up, they of course, they took him to the doctors, and, you know, doctors couldn't diagnose what was wrong with this child. Uh, they they went through all kinds of things. They thought he had the flu. They thought he had um, appendicitis. They you know they thought he had the measles. It, it was something different mm-hmm. constantly. Now the reason this was happening was because every time they would diagnose him and think they knew what was wrong, his symptoms would change. So you know he went through you know fevers and and stomach cramps and. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he, he mm-hmm. broke out in a rash. They thought it was was measles, and you know all these strange things. And as a result, they didn't really know how to treat him. So, you know, at, at some point, the family just sort of took him home, and you know, they they called friends and relatives, and essentially, over a period of time, did a lot of prayer and, and positive energy focused on this boy, and he did recover. Uh, so at this point. You know, even the parents have been very confused about it. You know, they've sort of flip-flopped back and forth between, um, you know, having sort of a religious view of it and then not. But I I spoke to them recently, and at this point, they actually both feel like this was something evil, something demonic, and that it was just prayer that, that saved this child. Uh, you made a comment in the book that you said if Satan is trying to get converts, he's going about it the wrong way because <laughs> everybody's turning <laughs> to religion, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> oh, that's that's so true. Uh, now, there was a story in the book that really, really got to me, um, and that was the angel of death, Azrael, right? The archangel of death. Right. Talk about that story. That's just an amazing story. I know it's kind of long, but yeah. maybe you can... It, maybe it is kind of long. I've had a, a lot of bit. people comment on that. Um, and, you know, essentially it was... Uh, uh, there's a whole sort of subculture out there which um, sort of looks at the Azrael, the angel of death, in a very different light. And, you know, in the particular encounter that you're talking about, it was a woman who... Um, Gosh, I'm trying to remember all the details now. She she went to be with her grandparents. In Italy, uh, right? In Italy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, she was was staying with them, and basically they were both uh, really ill. And what ends up happening essentially is that the, the she believes that she met the angel of death as a man uh, with solid black eyes and... Um, you know, he showed up at the door and essentially came to retrieve her uh, grandparents. Now, and she thought it was coming after her grandmother at first, right, because the grandmother was so ill, right? She did initially, yeah, and uh, and it actually wasn't. It came after the grandfather. And, um, you that know, it's just... just it's, it is. It's a very moving story, and, and sitting with her and, and hearing her recount it, you know, it's just a very, very emotional and very intense tale. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, when she they talk about the robe it had on, it had wings, feathered wings, mm-hmm. um, handsome, but the eyes were solid black, which would be very... 
scary, but I guess because the grandparents came from Italy and they believed in this, do you think that maybe they created this being? Do you think that's possible? Yeah, maybe possible. we're doing it? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very possible. It, it's mm-hmm. you know the this being you know he was um, it, it's it's interesting in that particular case because he was frightening but uh, compelling and soothing all at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it was a really strange mixture of emotions that she went through with this, you know, because there was a certain level of peace about the whole thing. And you know, as you said, I mean, his his eye, you know, she she said that he was very very handsome and very stunning, but you know his eyes were solid black. His his wings were actually black, and uh, you know it was um, it was a very real experience for her, and it was basically a very peaceful transition uh, for the grandparents when this occurred. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, just and you know she had it. she had some similar things happen where you know she felt like she was in a trance state almost during part of the encounter and, and wow. you know, it was uh yeah, it's it's a powerful story. I, I, I It is. It is. Yeah, I think maybe the grandparents, you know, because of their customs and their religious beliefs, both believed that the angel of death would come for them and perhaps they had created that and I wonder if the black eyed children, maybe because of all the fear and the anger in the world right now, do you think that maybe we're creating these entities, these beings, that we manifest yeah. them with our minds? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's that's very possible. There's a chapter in the book um, that talks about that a little bit. It, it's the the, um, the concept is called a tulpa. Uh, in the Western world, we would more commonly use the term thought form. But uh, if you go back to tribal traditions, especially in the East, uh, you know, Tibet, for instance, has an age-old tradition, um, and that's where the term tulpa comes from, about a being that is created in stages that uh, first takes uh, a form almost like a ghost. And mm-hmm. uh, this is this is from pure mental energy now that this is happening. So uh, mental slash emotional energy is being focused into this entity and it goes from being just a, a very wispy uh, apparition to gradually taking on more solid form. And in ancient Tibetan teachings, this being can become fully solidified and, you know, walk around just like you or I. Now, this is a, a being that is manifested from energy, and in order to continue to survive, it needs energy to fuel itself, uh, just like we need, you know, food and water. So sure. uh, these entities, while they can take on their own life and their own essence, uh, they have to have something to feed them. And, you know, one of the easiest things to feed on in emotional terms is fear because that's a very high level of energy that can be generated. And, you know, it, it's very compelling to me because... I find it interesting that in the greater portion of these encounters, the whole point on the surface is that they want you to invite them inside. But what I perceive as being the uh, the goal is that they're creating this really high level of fear in their victims, and then they're gone. You know, uh, the bulk of the time when that victim reaches the peak of fear, these kids vanish. So it's as if they've achieved what they wanted by creating that spike in energy within people. Right, right. Now, now you said that you've just maybe had a um, a few people contact you and do a follow up. Have you talked to other people and and how their lives are since having these encounters? Yeah, I, I've spoken to a fair number of these people, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, still we'll touch base with some of them. On occasion, some of them will contact me, and you know, you see varying degrees of uh, trauma still with these people. Uh, the after effects tend to be um, very devastating initially to people who have the encounters. They will experience um, restlessness, uh, disrupted sleep patterns. You know, some of them even become very uh, fearful and, and you know outright paranoid. 
some of them have difficulty if someone rings the doorbell or knocks on something. You know, a lot of these uh, victims are uh, still afraid that these kids are going to come back. And, in fact, there are stories I couldn't even include in the book, even even if I offered complete anonymity and, and offered to obscure mm-hmm. the, the location and everything. Some of these people, they just didn't want their story told at all oh, because sure. they believed that it would call these children back if they talked about it too much. And, mm-hmm. you know, they they talked about it initially because they're looking for someone to give them answers. And, uh, you know, so they'll, they'll have a handful of people that will talk to about it. I, I mean, you know, me just by default because I've been exploring the, the phenomenon and because of my connection to the, the paranormal and, and right. research in that area. But they'll, they'll consult, you know, their priest or their rabbi, you know, spiritual people and, you know, trying to get answers and essentially comfort uh, to, you know, help them feel like this is over and it's not going to happen again. Right. So how have these stories changed your life or your beliefs or your religious beliefs? Has it changed you a lot? I don't think it's changed me a lot. It's, um, you know, it's, it's been a very compelling journey to look at these things and to examine it, but mm-hmm. I've been exploring the paranormal since I was a kid, so, you know, I'm not going to say that nothing surprises me anymore, but, <laughs> but you know, I, honestly, I find, it, I find it all very fascinating, and, you know, I've, I've never lost my passion for exploring mm-hmm. these things, so um, it, it's all incredibly interesting to me. What would you do if they showed up at your door? What would be your reaction, do you think? You know, that's really hard to say because, you know, I've met so many people that, uh, you know, like John is a good example, uh, excuse me, Paul is a good example because, you know, he, all of his training, you know, and all the whole way he led his life, you would not have expected him to react that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the same is true, another fellow I didn't mention, but John, uh, who was a military man who ran into one of these kids, you know, in the middle of the night on, on just a lonely back road in Texas. And uh, he ended up running away from them. So it's it's really difficult to say. I think there's something else that is occurring during these encounters. You know, it can almost be something akin to uh, infrasound or you know, some type of energy that is being emitted that, disrupts people's nervous systems and uh, causes these things to, you know, have an effect that just would not occur under normal circumstances. Mm-hmm. You know, you never know how you're going to react until something like that happens, something that's right. just so out of the norm that, you know, mm-hmm. you panic or, you know, like you said, at first they seem like normal kids until you see their eyes and, like you said, you all these people go through these different stages of emotions and and then okay. panic and fear, ultimate terror <laughs> strikes them. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. that's just amazing. Just amazing. Well, David, we we've just about run out of time here, but um I was just kinda wondering, you know, we're approaching the Mayan calendar date of twelve, twenty one, twenty twelve. So what do you think is is going to happen. What are your views on that? Well, I think we'll all be around to celebrate uh, bringing 2013 in. <laughs> I do, too. I think so. And, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I, what kind of sums up my belief on it is a, a cartoon that I found quite some time ago. Um, I might have shown you this one. It's this Mayan stone carver who's walking into a room and he's holding the Mayan calendar. And uh, there's a, a king, you know, in the robes and everything he's standing there. And the stone carver's holding this calendar. And he says, hey, I only had room to go up to 2012. And the king is saying, ha, that's going to really freak somebody out someday. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, great. you know, I, I think that, I, I mean, I, I've been all over Central and South America, and I've talked to a lot of Mayan elders, and, and the truth is, is that, you know, those guys, they're not talking about the end of the world. They're talking about the end of a cycle. And I think that's really what we need to understand. This planet is going, you know, there's so many different levels of crisis going on right now. There right. really are. And, right. you know, this whole fear paradigm, 
that's been created around 2012 it is not helping any. Uh, no. you know, if more people would embrace the idea that we're moving, you know, it's an opportunity to move into a more positive vibration, into a more positive way to live our lives here on this, this planet, you know, maybe we could start making some greater breakthroughs. Absolutely. Well, you know, look at Y2K, 2000. Everybody thought it was going to be the end of the world with all the right. computers. And That's nothing right. <clears throat> nothing happened. So, That's you know. Right. And, and, you know, the truth is we're already going through a lot of transformation right now. And there's more right. to come. You know, whether, mm -hmm. whether people in, embrace it and try to make something positive of it or not, it, you can't, no matter who you are, where you are, you can't stick your head in the sand anymore and just say, well, it's not affecting me. Because no. guess what it is? It's affecting each and every one of us. And, you know, the best thing we can each do is, is walk our, our path as best we can and, you know, help the people around us. David, since you've been involved with shamanic, uh, different things, shamanic, and, and I know you dealt with the elders and everything. Don't they believe that we can dream a new world into being? Do they believe oh, in that? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I believe, yeah. too. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, we co-create we co our reality. And, mm -hmm. you know, the sooner we begin to realize that and, you know, stop, uh, stop allowing the level of oppression that we're all experiencing right now and, and mm -hmm. start, you know, co-creating and manifesting, you know, something more positive, then we're going to continue to have these traumatic experiences. That's right. Absolutely. Well, David, we've run out of time. We've just got a few more minutes, but um, uh, do you have any new books in the work, uh, works or uh, conferences? I know you've got a, a big symposium coming up, so tell us about that. Sure. I've got a ton of projects in the works, uh, <laughs> Betsy. I've got... Um, yeah, the next thing in, gosh, just over a week, I'll be in Minneapolis at the mm -hmm. Paradigm Symposium. And for anybody who hasn't heard about this event, you need to go online and, and see what's going on. It is the event of the year. Um, wow. The incredible A-list of people, Eric Von Doniken, who hasn't been in this country for uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 years. Right. Uh, Giorgio Sukulis, uh, Phil Copens. Bill Burns, just an incredible array of people attend, uh, coming to this event to speak. And uh, that is put on by Scotty Roberts and Micah Hanks, uh, two friends of mine who run Intrepid Magazine. Uh, so that, that is, as I said, that's the event of the year. Even if you can wow. go for a day, it's going to be worth it. Um, and that is the 18th through the 21st of this month. Uh, beyond that, gosh, I, I have a whole long list of things that uh, will be coming along from me. And um, I have a couple of other books in the works, uh, one on tulpas, actually, that we touched on briefly tonight, and uh, mm -hmm. another one oh, wow. that will uh, that will possibly possibly be out even before that mm -hmm. on uh, just some of these strange beings that uh, show up around the world. And I've got a couple of film projects in the works, and... Uh, just that it's been an incredibly busy oh, year. It doesn't look like it's slowing down for 2013. So, <laughs> oh great! Well, yeah. it sounds exciting. Would you give out your information and website and where people can purchase your book? Absolutely, you can get the book uh, directly at leprechaunpress.com, and you can find my work at twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com. That is T W O. C R O W S paranormal.blogspot.com. You'll see uh, different accounts. You know, there's some black eyed kid stories on there that came in after the book was published, along with uh, things from all other aspects of the paranormal. There's a badge on there from my Facebook. You, you know, welcome people to friendly mm -hmm. on Facebook. There's a Twitter feed. And uh, those are the best ways to keep up with what's going on with me. Oh, great. Well, David, thank you so much. It's just been a great show, incredible information, and really just spookier than heck. <laughs> so thank you so much. And I hope to see you at a conference one of these days again. It was uh, great meeting you a few months ago, and, and maybe our paths will cross again someday here. I'm sure they will. Well, uh, thanks for having me on, Betsy, and have a good Thank night, you. Okay? Thank you, and I want to thank all the listeners out there for joining us tonight. 
And this concludes our show for this evening. Until next time, keep those rainbow visions in your heart. Bye, everybody, and thanks again.